So this project will um, deal, among others, with some of the sustainable development goals um, that are uh, reducing inequality, um, climate change, um, and um, we have decided to offer some training, some live trainings and some webinars, especially on the topics of um, inclusion and the topic of uh, environmental sustainability. Uh, maybe next slide. Sorry. So um, we have different um, parts of the project and under the training part, we are planning to do two webinars a year. And um, one of them will deal with either inclusion or environmental sustainability, and the other one will deal with um, uh, technology and more artistic points. And we will have workshops this year. We will have a workshop on environmental sustainability, but in future we will also have a live workshop um, on the inclusion topic. So there's a lot to look forward to. And Misha is our very first speaker um, in this Ignite project. So I will hand over to Misha for the rest of the webinar, most of it. Hello, everybody. Happy to see you. Nice uh, seeing all these faces that I know. Uh, it's the first webinar for me, so I hope I won't make too many mistakes. And it's the first in English. I give a lot of French conferences, but not that many in English. So I hope it will all go well. Uh, as Sonia said, I'm here to speak about disabilities. And I got it wrong, so I'll try again. It should be this one. There you are. Um, why disability? Uh, when uh, I, I was a choir master for about six years when I was young, and in my different choirs, I had somebody that had uh, Mongolian, somebody that was in a wheelchair, somebody that had a degenerative uh, sickness. And I was always amazed because for me, it was complicated. For all the other children, it was quite easy. And if I give a few keys, then the others could take care of the, uh, of the disabled person. Uh, at that time, we in 2005, uh, there's uh, quite a lot of questions in French about inclusion. Uh, I know that in Norway or in Germany, we're quite far up for inclusion, but we're not in France. And so it was quite a new project to the, have the idea of having a uh, disabled people sing with uh, normal people. Benefits of singing. Um, and it's, it's uh, really important to uh, get to know all the researchers that are doing uh, quite a lot of new things that are coming uh, around how music can help as a neurologic way, uh, everybody, not only disabled. And so not only when you start singing, uh, you put your brain in action, but you put your body in action, you put your soul in action. And all of that working together makes that you become a better person as a more vertical person. And all my research has been on how to help people become more vertical. Uh, it helps to manage emotions too. That's really something that is complicated for everybody. And everybody has the experience of going, having a bad day, going to going to Gaia, going to a reversal, and coming back. Because not only you were far from all the emotions of the day, not only you managed to sing and be happy singing, but you're also bounded with other people. And that is a very, very uh, experience for living to be in a choir and to feel how you can bound with people just through music. And I wanted to feel that experience for people that can't experience because they live in institutions and they can never get to sing in a choir as we know what choir is. So there's a lot of things around cooperation, around respect that you can use through choir. And when you work with autistic children who have a difficulty with cooperation, they maybe can't go as a corporation when they are in, in the school, but when they come to choir and we have specific exercises to have with them, you can see that they can start feeling like what could be corporation. And if there is corporation, that means that the person behind you, or next to you, or in front of you, the autistic child can see. But well, normally, if he's really retired, well, really a severe autistic person, it's difficult for him to see that there's other people in that room. Our voice, we can't see it. So we never quite know if we're going to be able to use it or not. Each time you start inhaling, you think, is it going to be there? Is it not going to be there? Oh, I'm too tired to sing. 
I'm too shy to sing. Whereas if you play on a piano, if you play like that or a bit stronger, there'll be a slight difference, but not the same difference as when you sing. And so psychologists say that our voice is our signature. It's if you pick up the phone, listen to a voice, you know who it is. Pick up a look, look in a society in a train. It would take you time to find if you know somebody or not. Somebody speaks in the train and you know the person is speaking. So a voice is sort of like a, it captures you, it captures you. And as you catch the sound of the voice, you hear if they're tired, if they're stressed, if they're happy. And it gives things that you cannot imagine that you, or that you really don't want to give. Do you really want to know, to show that you're not well that day? Well, your voice is going to tell it for you. And so there's quite a lot of difficulty in shyness, but for everybody to start singing. Somestic sensations is a, a word for psychologists. Oh, yes, I didn't say, I didn't present myself, I should have. Uh, so I was a choir master for six years uh, while I was doing my studies to become a psychologist. And at the same time, I was doing my uh, studies to become a musical therapist. When I finished all of that, I wasn't quite convinced by musical therapy because I thought it a bit awkward to say, all right, let's gather up together, let's listen to music. And then everybody will say what they thought about that music and that will be therapy. At the same time as I finished my studies, it was in 2001, and here came all the ideas about if we mix people together, what can happen? And I thought it was much more important to work on uh, inclusion than to work on as a musical therapist. So I then worked for about 10 years, something like that, for Coeur en Coeur. I'll talk about Coeur en Coeur after. Um, and then came the COVID. Mm -mm, mm -mm. COVID and singing. Mm -mm, doesn't go together. COVID and singing and disabled people doesn't go together at all. And at the time, most of my work was with uh, nursing homes. So nursing home and COVID and fire, there was the end of my career. And on the 20th of March, when the confinement in France started, I didn't have any work anymore. So uh, it took me a bit of time to say, what, what should I do? Uh, I became a psychologist in an institution that has adults with autism. And then came the second confinement, and uh, I decided to become a psychologist uh, working for my own. So I now have three days with the, with the, the adults that have, been a bit, uh, that have autism, and I have two days at home where I receive people from my town as a psychologist. So for the time being, I have no more inclusion choirs, and I gave them to others so when they started again, see how that goes on in the time. Come back to our presentation. So our voice is the somatic sensation. That is what you feel in your own body. Uh, if you don't feel your feet, you can't sing. If you don't feel there's sort of something that's bringing you higher, I don't know how to say it in, in English, the, the voice isn't going to have the same sensation. So that's what you feel in your body and what you adjust to be able to sing. And then there's the corporality is in your voice, you can, uh, well, I can, and mostly most uh, choir masters can hear um, what, what image body you have. There's some people that have a huge voice and they have something like a corporality that's very, very, very big, very, very, very strong. And then this is they have a teeny bit of voice that you can sort of imagine. You can, it's just an image, it's not a reality of how people can see themselves unconsciously. And that is really interesting because it's difficult to get to the unconscious of the person. So if you can get to the how the person, how you can hear the person, you can change the image of the unconscious image of the person in the way of helping change his voice. So great. Yeah, super idea. Mm. Um, then comes a choir. Well, I like choir because when I'm in an institution and I start singing, there's no need for equipment. So that's quite good because I just need a few chairs and still, I just need a room and then we can start singing. Whereas if you have an orchestra and you have to have the orchestra sing, you have to pay the instrument, well, buy the instruments 
get everybody to start learning how to read music. And it's quite a lot of work. The most natural and probably the most old way of people to play music. It's also a group activity. Uh, if you learn your clarinet in your own room, and if you go to singing, it's really not the same thing. And it's a way where you're going to meet people. Um, I was part of the Coeur National des Jeunes, ma Coeur Joie, and uh, I have deep, deep, deep friendship from these people. Uh, it's, it's, uh, there's quite a few that got married even. So it's quite fun to have an activity where you're going to meet people. And as I said before, there's no musical pre-request. Pre uh, you don't need how to read music. You can just hear a song and play the song after. When Clueless Choirs uh, was a um, creation uh, that we did in 2015 uh, for a meeting that was done by ECA in uh, Helsinki. Uh, and it started before. So the, the story of Clueless uh, of, uh, Choirs is the French, tra French translation of Hearts and Harmony. Uh, it started in 2004, as I said. It was done by Michel Chirou, who was uh, the choir master of my parents' choir. A bit complicated. Anyhow, a very important person for me and a very important person for France because he was at one point a minister for a, a French government. So he had quite a lot of people around him. And when he met Thierry Thibault, that was the, uh, person, uh, the director of Accurchois, uh, they decided together to try and find a way to put disabled people and uh, and people from Accurchois, singers from Accurchois together. That was the creation of the association was in 2004. The point was to do it a big, big concert with more than 300 people uh, au Palais des Congrès. It is in Paris, one of the main concert halls. Um, and it was a, a big, big event. It was really quite amazing to be able to put 300 people on the same stage. Uh, there was probably a thousand people in the public for a first concert of a little association. Um, Thierry Thiebaud must have spoke to Sanya and Coeur uh, en became Hearts and Harmony in 2006. And it gave uh, quite a few festivals in Europe Spain, uh, I remember a very, very interesting seminar on uh, how to have uh, different generations things together. And that was probably, I would say, 12 or 13 years ago. So uh, that kind of choir in France didn't exist at all. And it was really, really interesting to see how different uh, countries put together different ways of putting different generations together. In Belgium, for example, uh, it was just natural. It was, there was no question about it. They had been doing it for ages. Uh, but uh, in Serbia, it existed for. And then we all went to Serbia, uh, Novi Sad, where there was a Heart and, uh, Heart and Harmony Festival over there. Uh, I remember one time. Uh, so that was interesting because they were trying to see how people that couldn't sing uh, could have instruments. And they were putting motors in the instruments so it was easier to use. So it was quite funny to have motor instruments uh, uh, working. Um, one of my big, big memory was when we, the second day of Novi Sad, it was so hot and it was so, um, uh, uh, yeah, it was hot, it was difficult. And there were, I don't know, 400 kids, disabled or disabled, you didn't care, that were singing together. And uh, they were just so happy to be together and to know that they were going through a special time, special moment. Whereas, as we were looking, I remember the guy from the States, there was even a guy from the States at that concert, uh, at that uh, festival. And um, he was, we were just amazed how the kids were so uh, grateful. But we don't know, uh, put 300 kids having just a, a sandwich of. Uh, a sandwich and a, a glass of water, and they would all complain. All these kids were so happy to be together and so grateful of sharing that time. So all these festivals in Europe were a really, really good time. It was a way to see how inclusion is different from one country to the next and to um, get ideas, I'll put it that way, from, uh, from all the different choir masters. And I learned really a lot thanks to Arts and Harmony. 
uh, in France, I don't know how it went. Uh, I lost a bit of contact uh, with the other, other countries. But in France, we had four or five concerts that were with 300 people. So you can imagine the logistics that that means. We had, had before COVID 50 inclusive choirs. We gave tons of conferences, tons of training courses. Uh, and we do hope that all of that will start again. We still, uh, I think, I'm, I think we are going to start in nursing homes in next September. So everybody's very careful because we tried a few times to start again the inclusion of choirs, and it was too soon compared to COVID. And uh, trying and stopping and trying and stopping uh, gets too long, and it's too 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 painful to stop again. We'll see if we manage to get out of it this time. Just to explain uh, exclusion, uh, I'll, I'll just talk about plans because I don't know how it is before. Um, before, if you had a disabled kid, it was told to the parents, right, your, your kid is awkward, uh, just give it to the society and we're going to take care of him and we'll put him in an institution and that institution will take care of him from his birth to his death. It was said that way. Uh, so that was about in the 40s into the 70s, and we never really had segregation, but we did have integration in the beginning of the 90s. So that means that, for example, the uh, 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 um, excuse me, the uh, children, the, the the child that has disability, isn't in the uh, institution, is in the normal school. But in that normal school, you have a specific class. And all the disabled people, if they're blind, if they're deaf, if they have mental problems, will be in the same class. So that was a good idea because they could see other children, but a bad idea because it wasn't specific. Uh, the help that we were giving wasn't specific for the, for the people. And now we'll say um, beginning of 2000, 2005, uh, we are now trying to have uh, uh, a child that's not well or a child that's disabled is in this class of his age and has specific aid in his class. So that's what we're trying to do. Uh, when I say a mix in, in, in uh, inclusive choirs, it can either be uh, half half or it can be one person in a normal in a normal group. Whatever it is, we do try always not only just to put things together because that's what the mistake that we did at the beginning but to find ways to bound all the people together so everybody learn from the specific person is different. Um, so cultural democracy uh, was, uh, was the, 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 the baseline of uh, what we were doing. Here are the five keys of uh, Kanker. I'll let you read them. I don't see many faces, so I don't know if you're finished, but I will suppose that you are. And something very important for us is ethic. So um, I don't know if you remember, but I do remember certain choir masters that were not kind. Their object was to have a good choir, a good sound, but the chorus they were in the choir were just a tool. Choir master. Whereas we really worked for the choir master to put a climate, and it's important for it to be as stable and caring as possible. If it always comes to say a person that's shy, a person that doesn't know how to get into it, is going to say, Right, here I feel secure. And it's important, really, really, really important for us as inclusive choirs for people to be caring. Uh, it's also important that everybody has the same place in the group. If you have two children that are 12 and another one that's eight and another one that's 16, you're going to have different reactions. And the point of the choir master is to have a even more, so I don't know it's English, uh, to, to, to find how, how, how each person can find his place in the group. 
Uh, there's another thing that I quite like is the egregore function. So that's also, it's maybe, maybe more in sp spirituality than, the, than in psychology. But it means that uh, if you have three people, it becomes a group. And the group is more than just those three people. And when you're going to start taking care of a choir, you will always address yourself between the group, the egregore, and the team. And you have to have, find a mix between feeling what the egregore is, because it's difficult to find, and we're going to go and get people for them to start singing because they're quite shy or they don't know how to sing, and trying to calm down the one that's taking the lead. Um, it seems simple, uh, but it's years and years of experience to manage to get. And in the end, there's no hierarchy, uh, hierarchy sorry, uh, between chorus. So uh, whatever happens, it's our job to calm down the people that want to find, find the lead and to help the children that can't get in the group or they can't come to sing to help them. Uh, I'll try and show you a video. I hope it's going to work. Uh, it's a video uh, that uh, is done by different inclusion choirs in Wakulung. So Wakulung is where I live. Uh, so we sort of used Wakulung as a, uh, a, a way to see if uh, experiment way. Uh, so there you are. It's in French. I'm sorry, I don't have it in English. And I'll just let the sound go on. The video go on. Where is it? des établissements qui reçoivent des personnes âgées. Les personnes âgées, on a compris, c'est très difficile qu'elles sortent de l'établissement. Par contre, que nous, on aille dans les des maisons de retraite, c'est essentiel. Et pour les personnes... There seems to have a problem, so... It seems to have a problem, so what I'll do is that I'll put it in the chat so you can go and look for it after. So, um, uh, in France, um, we had uh, first disabled people, in, uh, for, for, um, for, for inclusion choirs, we had first only disabled people. And then there was a law that said that there, there could be situations of disability and elderly people could come in that kind of categorization. So we started taking care of elderly people too. Uh, there was a, quite a few research that were done. And one of them was very interesting to see how uh, a choir, an inclusive choir could help the people that had their parents in a nursing home uh, to go and see them and to keep bounding with those people because we do realize that after the years, uh, children stop going to see the ugly people and, uh, and we, they, they, they lost contact. And through the choir, uh, I had a choir for more than 10 years and parents, children stayed as long as their uh, parent was there and then stayed further on. Uh, we also had an interesting uh, topic on uh, choir and autism. Um, I'm not allowed to show those pictures because we don't know how we do they're not, the project isn't finished, uh, but as soon as the project is finished, I'll show you the videos. Uh, it was to see how, uh, if we sang, when uh, Christian was there, he was part of the project, so maybe he can talk about it later. Um, it was to show uh, that maybe uh, through choir and through inclusive choir, we could help people to start uh, talking. And uh, there were quite a lot of the results. I'll go fast because I see the time is going going fast. But uh, 
why autism? Uh, the changes, uh, a long time ago, we said it was because of the mother. Then a bit long time, a bit less long time ago, we said it was because they could imitate what is true. And uh, now we realize that there's a bump conception, a different uh, primary visually and aud uh, auditory cortex so that their brain isn't the same. Uh, and because their brain isn't the same, they don't sense the same way. Uh, for example, uh, where I work, I have an adult that cannot make the difference between if I was speaking, a plane was in the sky and there was something like that. What you'll do straight away is concentrate only on my voice. They can't do that. So if you live in chaos, and you can't sense correctly, the only way to protect yourself is to shut down. And that's one of the reasons of autism. One of the other one that is really important to understand and see is that because of this sort of fog, they don't know how to uh, imitate. So something that is natural about to be able to take a pen, you see your parents do it, you do it, and a little child that's one will stop taking things and understanding that it's pen. If you don't teach, it's a bit, it's it's too too simple what I'm saying, but it is it's, it is that problem. If you don't teach him to say that that's a pen and you have to take your pen, he won't do it. But through choir, we realized that if there was something that was bound in together by energy, they could find things that, we, that they can't do naturally. So uh, I'll just let you leave that because it's a bit complicated to explain. And I'll just explain the end. Promotes comorbidity, uh, comorbidity, comorbidity is something else. So that means that because you're singing, is going to harmonize what you're hearing. So if we all sing together, it, you're not going to hear the plane anymore. And it's going to create a harmony that can help the autistic person to be only in the sound. And so even if he can't feel his speech, even if he can't uh, understand what's going on, there's something from only listening to the sound that makes it materially, he's not in chaos anymore. Um, singing is easier than speaking. Uh, they also have a problem of if we say, I love my mother, they can only hear love. They're not going to understand. There's, there's words that have more power than other words. So he is going to stay on the power of the word love. And he's going to block, whereas you've gone on. So even if you continued the conversation, maybe an autistic person stopped at one point because there's a word that had more color than the other words. Whereas if you're singing, it's sort of like a band is going on. And he'll follow the band, well, he won't follow the words. And that's what I was saying, meaning is more important. Uh, less important when you sing. If you talk, if you're just saying poetry, it has less impact than if you're talking to the person. The person hears your feeling. And he's going to clack show your history or through the feeling that you have for him, and not to the words you say. So it was really, really. It was a four-year study. Uh, it was supposed to be two. With COVID, it became four. Uh, and what was interesting in the configuration is that uh, I would be there every week. We would have one hour session per week. And then there's video people that would come every month. And we looked at those videos with uh, somebody that was doing the same thing as us in piano, so piano and autism. Uh, somebody that was a specialized uh, psychologist that worked for the University of paris me and the videos. And each video that was an hour took us four hours, five hours to go. So we really saw everything special and really saw what I could then work for the next session. Um, 
work in a natural environment is important. As I was saying, what we realized is that through singing, they could only catch on uh, what was auditive. But if you, you manage to get that with people, and then you put on the walls lovely butterflies, they're going to start looking at the butterflies, whereas you forgot about them. So it's really important that there's nothing on the world, just chairs. If you can, not too much light, and try and be as neutral as possible. Uh, do not stop the stereo TVs, that is important too. Um, if you have a person that's going like that all the time, it gets on your nerves and you try and stop it. But if you do it too, and you realize that it's a way of protecting himself and cutting the environment out of him. And what we did is that instead of saying, please sing, we used this and this, and this became an artistic way. And little by little, starting from this as him, we got to something where we could be together. And so uh, not stop stereotopy is really, really nice to do. Um, so what do we need to focus on when we're taking care of autistic people? Uh, they're often completely like that. And you all know that to be able to sing, you have to find a vertical axe. So we work on that again, 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 and again. Uh, jubilation. Uh, jubilation is what uh, a kid that's about three months old, when suddenly he can understand that he can, oh, I'm so happy, I finally understood it. How he could take the thing. Or he could finally take his bottle of milk. That's jubilation. It's between three and six months and then it disappears. Uh, and most of the autistic care people didn't go. Through. So we try and find ways where they can go back to things that they didn't experience. Uh, what kind of warm up? Um, marshmallow and carambar. That's uh, my, my exercise and my favorite exercise. Marshmallow is when you, without any, uh, without any axe. And carambar is a sweet French in France. Uh, it's some caramel that's very, very hard and it's a sort of a stick like that. Uh, and so we spend our time going carambar, marshmallow, uh, carambar, marshmallow, marshmallow, marshmallow. Another thing that's important that, that we like doing is the glissando. We, we, and our brain is made on both sides. So if we have this hand that's going to act as that hand, this hand will have it that hand. And between, the link for autistic people isn't that strong. So the more we do exercises like that, the more we uh, train the brain. Um, another thing is a uh, smile, uh, let's go, sorry, uh, gazes. Uh, you can have lots of people, I can't do it myself, but go like that. It's the same thing. When you do that, you try and cut yourself from the environment. So how can we do an exercise with them? It slows down the thing. And they become something that's pretty to see. And then we're talking at, right at the beginning of uh, image, uh, body image. Uh, we realized that, for example, it's a good thing for them to put their hands behind their back because it's difficult to find your back. It's difficult to feel it. So uh, exercises where your hand is there, it's quite interesting. We know that maybe they can't uh, compress uh, comprehension uh, of uh, their uh, visual uh, sight. But here, as I was saying, lots of children do that. They do see things. So you can have exercises that go like that. But it's completely different to do an exercise that's artistic and that you only do it because it's artistic and they don't know everything that you're thinking in your mind. Then if you say left, right, left, right, and that they'll do left, right, left, right. What I'm saying for autistic children is worth for also uh, all ordinary uh, course. And uh, the more I see that Marianne is there, and the more you work with different publics, the more you see different uh, ways of being in a choir, the better choir master you get. Vibration is here. <coughs> Look 
because all this mouth and all these cheeks are very, very not understood by uh, the people. And then continue tempo. Uh, it's quite it's quite long to say. If you need that exercise to find, uh, um, I'll, I'll get it. But I use this. And so if you go like that. They can imagine when the end is, and so it's less scary. Um, and that's really something that we learned with Elena, say that for Christian. Um, if we looked at her in the eyes, she was scared. But she did like having people that were close from her. So if we uh, had an image where we had the person not looking at each other, it was much easier. And uh, a saturation is when a person can't understand what's going on, either because he's too tired or because he's, um, uh, how can I explain? Um, the environment is too strong for him. So if you're trying to do, you just do one, you don't sing it and clap. Instead of doing two things at a time, you just do one. So what kind of feedback did we have from that first study? Uh, joint attention, being, being with the person as long as the person isn't with you. Uh, jubilation, I talked about it. Suddenly there was more sound in the, uh, in the choir and people were more singing together. Um, and there was something of uh, a joy to come back. We were all waiting for the Friday morning and saying, oh yes, choir's there. It all became a special moment for us because we knew that, first of all, we were all together and it was important for us to be all together. And we knew that uh, something special was happening for this adult. In France, we are very good now for taking care of children with autism. Not very good at taking care of adults. Either they go to work and that's okay, or they're in institutions where we're gonna keep them busy. Keep them busy for a whole day is awfully long. And we're not uh, as sharp uh, to help them progress. So singing was a way to keep the uh, speech therapy. And that was really nice because we saw that they were progressing again and we were proud to be able to, to be able to help them with that. There you are, I finished and, uh, and questions are welcome. Thank you so much, Misha, for this uh, fantastic presentation. Um, it is really uh, fantastic to see the, uh, the work that you've been doing and uh, and it was just the, I really feel the caring and the kindness of, of your um, approach to this. And also really fascinating to me how you've been able to um, develop this approach and work with the characteristics of the, of the people with autism that you've worked with before. It's, um, this was very eye-opening to me as well. So thank you so much for that. Um, Anyone who has any questions, do feel free uh, to uh, raise your hand and speak, or if you're not comfortable to uh, do that, then you can write it in the chat and I'll read it out for you. Um, also, if you're joining us on Facebook, do feel free to uh, write in the comments there. We have uh, a team member monitoring that and they will uh, pass it over. So over to you, if you have any questions, comments, experiences that you would like to share. Sonia. <laughs> Maybe while people are still thinking about the questions, I just wanted to add a little bit because Misha said she had lost connection a bit to the other countries and what was happening in other countries. Um, Michelle chose a specific um, focus today, but um, of course there are a lot of projects um, that are dealing with people with different disabilities, sometimes um, specializing, so to speak, in one disability. 
Um, for example, if you're working with people with hearing disabilities um, uh, and you want to sing with sign language, you will not necessarily mix them with other people with other disabilities because this is a very specific need, but you can mix them with people um, that do not have disabilities and let them sing together. Um, so we've had uh, an event in Norway that was specializing on this and there's um, a school there that does a lot of sign singing, but there are also a lot of sign singing choirs around Europe. And then there's um, also often specific choirs for people with seeing, also seeing impaired people and blind people um, who um, don't actually need any special attention for the singing as such, because usually this is very easy for them, but they can't see the conductor, for example. So the conductor has to learn other techniques and maybe use breath and, and or a noise to help them keep the tempo. And um, again, it's um, and there are projects that bring people, um, seeing people together with others. And then we've had some that, that really deal with people with multiple disabilities. I must say, I was in Paris at this concert in 2006, which was fascinating for me because we had all these different types of people on stage. So there we really had all kinds of people and they didn't sing the whole program together because not everything was feasible for everybody, but it was very inclusive because everybody was able to stand on stage and sing something. And I think that's that's very important also to see that it you can also differentiate within the group, I think. If, if you want to make sure that everybody can do that, but you know that they cannot all do the same in the same context. I don't know if Misha wants to um, say a bit more about that, but I think that's, that's important to keep in mind, even within the group of people with disabilities, you will often have differences of stronger and less strong um, disability, and, and you still have to find a way of making everybody um, be able to join. Well, the concert was so, so exceptional and absolutely. Um, it was really, as you say, there, there were different disabilities. There were autistic people. Uh, and I put you the link of that choir because it's quite nice to see. And you'll see, I didn't talk about it, but there's, I call it uh, relational bubbles, how they sort of bound with the person next door. And it's really nice. Uh, and uh, there was a blind choir. There was uh, people with wheelchairs. There were um, people that were deaf, and about 150 chorus from uh, Accurjois. And uh, we had uh, three concerts in, in a row that were that um, so big. Uh, and it was really nice to do because uh, we sort of regretted that at the end of that concert uh, in 2006, we didn't have more time to be together. And so at the next concert, we had three reversals that were together. Uh, and we really tried to bound everybody together. And as I was saying with the Cœur National Vision, I still have friendships from there. I still have friends from the choir too. Uh, and we still meet together. And there's special, special moments that were shared thanks to being together in our diversity. Anybody else? Maybe another question, Misha, you said that Christian was maybe among the participants. Do you know if he's there? I know he's there. Does he want to speak? I don't know. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Well, I might ask as well, you mentioned obviously the um, effect of the pandemic on your own work. Um, I wonder if you could talk uh, a bit more about the the effect of the pandemic on on this kind of provision for um, yeah uh, like collective singing for people with disabilities. Has there been like a really big impact on this? Mm. In, uh... um, we all tried to keep contact, and so some of our uh, choirs, uh, the people that were from the outside of the nursing home, uh, sang uh, the balconies. So we could still see each other and give concerts like that. Uh, a lot of went on Zoom, uh, but uh, it's not that easy to keep a Zoom and to just have a Zoom connection when uh, you're in an institution. Um, 
there was a quite a lot that sent uh, recordings of uh, reversals so they could do the, do the reversals in the nursing home, even if the choir master wasn't there. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of creativity. Uh, and I'm sure that we all learned of uh, that pandemic and uh, found new ways of being together, even if we can't be physically together. Um, there's some choirs that uh, never stopped because it was too important uh, and the institution was small enough uh, to uh, to uh, say, all right, you can come in. Uh, and they had to do a COVID test before coming, just before. Um, there's others that only kept the people that come that were coming to sing and, and sang only with the people that were out of the institution to, to sing together. So uh, yeah, I'll say about uh, on the 50, I didn't contact, I didn't, I'm not in contact with everybody, uh, but on the 50, there was probably 30 that tried in a different way to be together and 20 where it was just too complicated and we just don't sort of like start again when it's possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's looking like they will start again? Uh, my guess is we lost a third. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, yes, Marianic. Um, yes, I will try to do. I, I have a bad uh, accent, and uh, maybe I will mistake with the words. But uh, uh, just, uh, um, I would like to tell something about uh, what I have done uh, because I, when I was reading uh, on the feedback to jubilation and uh, what is very good after for how they feel. Uh, for the first time, we had an experience uh, because I have a choir of uh, with teenagers from different uh, care homes. Before, it was just for one care home, and after I am in a music school conservatoire, working in a conservatoire, and they come at the conservatoire. So different disabilities, uh, autistic, uh, not autistic, just um, late or uh, but difficulties talking, uh, understanding and things. Well, anyway, now they are in the same group. They come from free care home or what they call day hospital. So there are different degrees of disability. They are between 14, maybe 20. And uh, three weeks ago, we have been invited in a, what we call a shared home for old people with Alzheimer, where there were nine people of Alzheimer, uh, some totally 90 years, some uh, very tonic, it depends. And for my uh, teenagers, it was the fact they were considered as the normal people arriving, giving pleasure to the, um, the group. So it was a really a change of uh, balance between uh, disability and not. And uh, there are some things where uh, singing wa was, um, of course, uh, there were very good reaction from the old people, but also very good, sorry, uh, good reactions from the teenagers, uh, changing totally their uh, behavior, being responsible uh, in a group uh, they have formed even their, with their body, standing um, like a very academic choir, and um, at the end, we have, uh, because I live in Britain, in the um, west of France, we have danced with some of the old people uh, in the grass, in the garden. And when we left, the teenager was saying, oh, it was too much beautiful. <laughs> but they were in a place where there were no more autistic, there were no more disabled, nothing. They could read. Uh, and also, as I was coming, we were singing with a karaoke to have the music behind. And one who can't talk anything was installing me my computer to connect with the Wi-Fi. But suddenly they have changed totally. There were the normal people who were uh, giving something to the other old people. And I was, uh, if I can say you, uh, the last week I was always crying because I was very, very stressed for everything in the job and things. And just with me, I was so happy with the, what they gave. But they were very, 
Yes, it's this image that uh, there were no more the disabled, but there were. Uh, uh, it's very sorry. I don't know how to explain, but I think you can feel what I mean. So uh, they are thirteen singers, uh, four carers who are with me every week in uh, at the conservatoire to sing together, and uh, and thank you, Misha. I carry on with that. Mm -hmm. huh? I still. Uh, <laughs> well met. Marie Annick was in the first web model, the first training course that we did with Accurjoie after that we stopped all the all the normal training courses. So just after COVID, we started that training course, and you were there at the time. Mm. Yeah, it's singing in a choir is an adventure. Singing with disabled people and having projects that you don't imagine is a grand adventure. And I really hope that you're going to go through that. Mm. And I think that that is a, a, a beautiful note to finish on. What a fantastic, and, and thank you so much for sharing this very moving experience, Maria Nick, as well. This is fantastic. Um, I, uh, I'm going to thank you all for coming then, but, but just before you go, I'm going to um, pass over to my colleague in communications, <laughs> Beatrice. Hello, hello everyone. Thank you again, Misha, for, yeah, for leading this important discussion and uh, thanks everyone who attended. And um, I invite you to follow us on social media. As you see, we um, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and also on LinkedIn. Um, next, Sophie. Yes. So also you can uh, follow us through our newsletter. We have a monthly newsletter and um, yeah, we will um, talk about we, we talk about like uh, what's new in the European Choral Organization Association and uh, what's new on our members uh, organization. Um, and then we have a section about like all the uh, international uh, activities, events, opportunities in the choral world. And also, um, of course, initiatives from all across the cultural sector. And then next, yes, we have uh, this campaign, uh, the benefits of singing <clears throat> campaign, sorry. That it's um, actually, uh, it really suits with uh, what Misha was talking about um, because we stressed on the different benefits of uh, collective singing. So the educational, social, physical, and uh, psychological. Um, you can find all information on our website, and we also have a media toolkit uh, where you can find the campaign graphics in uh, many languages. So thank you again, and uh, feel free to reach us out for other information. Sophie, I pass the word to you again. Yeah, thanks very much, Beatrice. And yeah, once again, thank you everyone for coming. Um, we will uh, share the link to the recording with you and also the resources that uh, Misha has been sharing in the chat there and everything. Uh, but thank you for joining in person and have a wonderful evening.